Hi everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Tim Joyner, I'm the principal here at Waukesha South High School. I appreciate the time. Um, we did one of these about a week ago, um, and we were just under an hour. Um, so it does not take the full hour by any means, but we do want to be here for any questions that you guys have. Um, Rick Lehman is over here. He's one of our assistant principals. He's also kind of in charge of the Waukesha One Initiative here at South High School. I also want to introduce Brian Yearling. He's one of our uh, district tech directors. Um, this is not, the iPad up here is not for so you to all say, oh, that's what you're getting. Um, we're actually recording this one so that we can put it on the website um, so that if you need to review any of the information, you certainly can. Um, also, for any parents who may not be able to access some of these meetings, we'll also put it up there as well. Um, again, I appreciate the time. Um, really, what this meeting is all about is just kind of giving you the information and the background as to why we're doing this and what we're going to move into. There's going to be more meetings that actually concern the iPad and how to utilize the iPad as a student and as a parent. And those are going to be you. Um, we're going to have those a little bit closer to the iPad rollout, which will be a few weeks before school starts. Because what we don't want to do is say, okay, here's how you use the iPad. Remember that for six months. Okay. So what we really want to do is kind of just give you some background information on the technology piece, and then we'll go ahead and um, move forward into the iPad rollout and give you more information from there. Just so you know, Brian ran our last meeting, um, and so I'm going to be kind of trying to run this one, but Brian's going to hop in and uh, hit any points that I might miss, so don't be surprised if Brian um, has to correct me or if Brian uh, brings up an extra point. Um, he's done this meeting lots and lots of times, and we're trying to get me to the point where I can present it over and over, because we still have about four or five more of these. So um, I appreciate your patience with that. What you have here is the School District of Waukesha homepage. Um, as you start to look at, okay, I have a question about iPad or the Waukesha One or um, what's, gonna, what's this going to look like at South High School. I want to direct your attention to this um, School District of Waukesha homepage. And there's a little tab down there, and it's uh, Waukesha, and then you see the H has a 1-1. One, one. So Waukesha 1-1, one one. Student 1, iPad 1. And if you click on that, that will actually take you to our Waukesha 1-1 one one initiative. This by far has the most information for you when it comes to why technology. Why are we putting this in our students' hands? What are we going to do with it? There is a tab up there for parents. Um, the first notch down is going to be the presentations. That's one of the presentations that we're actually going to do today. Um, probably the most powerful one is going to be the Frequently Asked Question tab to your far right. That has almost the majority of every very, very commonly asked question that parents and students ask. So it actually breaks it down into different subsections that you can look at. What about apps? What about the iPad itself? Um, all sorts of really, really common questions that you can get answers to just by clicking there. Um, and so that's a really easy way for you to get your answers really, really fast, really, really quick. A lot of times if you try to call me, it takes me a little bit of time because I'm not in the office, I'm in a meeting, I'm in classrooms. Um, and we could have gotten you the answer right here on the frequently asked questions. So please do peruse that one as you do have more and more questions. That's a really great resource for you. Uh, getting back to the presentation, we're going to be doing the first one, the orientation information. Um, and really, thank you, Brian. So we're looking at new horizons in the school district of Waukesha. Essentially what we're looking at is equipping our students with what kids will use in the workplace. I was at a, a Google conference a few weeks ago, and one of the presenters said, here's the interesting part. He's like, think about this. Think all the way back to third grade and what you were using in the third grade to help you learn. Maybe it was paper and pencil. Maybe some of you had some of those black screen with the green letterings. The worst piece of technology in our third graders' hands at this very moment will be an iPad. Whoa. So who knows what our students are going to be doing in the workplace? We're preparing them for jobs that don't even exist right now. So there's an essential need to help our kids utilize technology to increase their learning, to teach them how to use technology to become better equipped for their jobs, to be better community members, and to make Waukesha even better than it already is. So there's an incredible need for technology to be in our classrooms. And we want to help students learn better, more efficiently, and how to become lifelong learners through technology. 
And that's really what we're looking for when we go to this iPad one-to-one -one initiative. Um, and so I kind of covered that. Um, so we look, at, we look at each student deserving a customized learning experience. And so what technology allows us to do is really be responsive to your <laughs> student's needs. Uh, if your student needs to review something, there's YouTube videos, there's teacher videos, our own teachers are making videos to say, hey, if you need more time, let me go ahead and give you that video so that you can watch it again. Let me give you an extra worksheet so that you can do that worksheet. Let me give you some extra lesson time for you to get that. Um, if your student is way far advanced and they're ready for the next one, technology allows us to do that. It takes education from a place and a time where we sit your student down and say, okay, we're going to teach you social studies, but it's only for this 60-minute period. To, if you're interested in social studies, we can give you a whole wealth of information through technology at your time, in whatever place you're at, and help you to learn even more. Um, so in order to assist our student staff um, with this work, we're going to do a few things to really help out both our students and our staff. We're going to give every student access to an iPad. We're going to give every staff member access to a laptop and an iPad so that they can create these pieces of information for your student to review, to learn, and to expand on what they're doing in school. We're going to give them a dependable resource. So a lot of people are asking, well, why iPad? Well, the reality is why anything in particular? So it could be a Chromebook, it could be a Ace, what, an Asics, whatever <laughs> laptop, it could be any one of those. The reality of the situation is we want to give them a dependable resource with an infrastructure that allows us to say, okay, so it's not working right. We know we can send it off, get it fixed, and get it back into your student's hand as quickly as possible. Apple seemed to do that for us, and that seemed to be the most logical one. Um, and that's really what we're looking at, is really just getting down to, let's get technology into kids' hands so that we can teach them how to use it. And then we're going to remove restrictions that will hinder the educational process. This one is an interesting one, and this one is kind of a tough one for a lot of parents and students to, to really put a handle on, uh, and educators as well. Okay? Please understand that when you're sitting here going, I'm a little bit uneasy about this, we have students who are saying, I'm a little bit uneasy about this. We have teachers that are saying, I'm a little bit uneasy about this. We have principals saying, I'm a little bit uneasy about this. But the reality of the situation is, if we work together as a principal, as families, as students, and as teachers, we can figure this out and give our kids a wonderful educational experience. Are there going to be speed bumps in the way? Absolutely. One of the things that we talk about when we want to remove restrictions that will hinder the educational process that means that we want to allow kids to access education when they need to. And so that means giving them the ability to learn how to be an adult, to learn how to find education on their own. Okay? And so as we talk about high schoolers, we're talking about we're trying to prepare you to become an 18-year-old in the community. And so to do that, we want to help you gain whatever educational experiences that you need. Brian, do you want to hit on this one a little sure. bit? Sure. Um, and I'm thinking you're going along the lines of self-management yep. and what that means. So one of the things that um, is, is a real focus for us um, in this program is something called self-management. The idea ultimately being that in a district as large as Waukesha is, and with the diversity of needs that we do have um, across the district, we have forever existed in a world where tech, the technology department has ultimately said, here's the technology you have access to, here is how it's configured, and deal with that, right? Um, we'll try to make changes as we can, but it, it's not timely, it's not in the moment. As you know, life goes too fast for that. We can't constantly be waiting for somebody from the technology department to come and install something or fix something. And so the, the solution that we've come to that is called self-management is the idea that if we put the power back in the hands of the people who really need it the most, the teachers, the students, and their families, to make the decisions about what's best for them, we ultimately get the best of both worlds. We get the control that you're comfortable with as parents and guardians. We get the needs that, that students have specific to them. And we get ultimately the needs that the teachers have educationally. When uh, Tim talks about dependability, 
Um, it's not just device dependability, but it's the dependability that the resource is going to be there every day when you need it. Um, as I'm a high school English teacher by training, and so um, as some of your kids will attest to, when you have to, when you have lab days, when you have to go to a computer lab for something, that in reality looks like this. As a teacher, hopefully I can schedule a lab that will meet all of my classes' needs. So English 9 today, let's say. We're writing an essay for this teacher again. And um, hopefully, I've been working on this for two weeks. All of my kids are hopefully ready to write today. You know your kids as well as I do. There's no such thing as 30 kids doing the same thing at the same time, right? And so, <clears throat> as a teacher, I have to say, we're all going to go into the lab. We're all going to write on these computers at the same time. We're all going to be finished at the same time, and we're all going to turn in at exactly the same time. Hopefully, the lab is working on that day. Lab day comes, and we're going to go into lab. You're going to come to my class. How long, how long are classes here? 60 minutes. So I have 60 minutes. You're going to come to class. We're going to meet at wherever we're meeting. We're going to go into the computer lab. We're going to take 5 to 10 minutes to boot up. Now, out of that 60-minute class period, honestly, we're looking at 15 minutes is gone already and just getting that far. Okay? On top of that, we get settled in, we get started writing. So you've worked for 40 minutes, 50 minutes. I may have interrupted you for many lessons along the way, and then we shut down and get back to where we started. Right? We, we get, so out of a 60-minute period, we've lost you know, a third of it, maybe a little less than a third of it on that part. And that's what we talk about with dependability. So <clears throat> the self-management model is this. As a district, we have a guarantee of what we call our core apps. There are apps that will be for use for your son or daughter, child, student, um, that we can rely on as an educator. I can decide as the teacher, we're going to write today, and we're going to write using said app, one of these core apps, okay? Um, and I know that that group over there is not ready today, so they're going to be doing something a little bit different. This group, kind of the majority of us, are ready to write today, and this group, you guys are well beyond. You wrote yesterday. You're all set. And so I can diversify what I'm doing. But I also know that that group over there is struggling, and they need some extra help. And I know that a couple of them have a unique need. So I say to them, hey, why don't you pull up this app? Writing's a, a struggle for you. But I, know, I need to know what you're thinking. So if you'll pull up your Explain Everything app and explain what you're thinking, this group and this group just don't need that today. And so what the core apps do, which are the guaranteed viable apps that every student, every teacher are going to have access to on the iPad, what they do is they say, hey, we have, we have a consistent platform. Now, here's the self-management piece of this. You know your son or daughter. You know that the way they work, maybe they're really disorganized. And there's a great app called Evernote. Evernote, called your digital brain, is how they market it. And so you say, I think you could stay more organized if you use Evernote. In the old system, pre-self-management, you would have called technology and said, I think my son or daughter should use Evernote. We'd say, yes, but they're one in 14,000, and that's really hard for us to do. No longer do you need to do that. As a parent, you say, we're going to install Evernote on your iPad, and you're going to use that. Okay. So uh, what self-management lets you do is, as a family, decide what you're going to install, as a student, decide what you're going to install. We all understand one thing. So we're talking about a high school teacher, your parents, high school children. We all understand that when you're 14, 15, 16, 18 years old, 30 years old, you still you should struggle with what that means, right? How do I stay focused? How do I stay on topic? And so the ability to install anything means they are going to install anything, right? Students can install games. They can install... Um, Timecasting things, they can install organizational things, they can install educational things. We're going to talk about the expectations on the iPad in just a little bit, but what I want you to, the concept I want you to get is never before have we had the ability to say to you, yes, but you can control that. So there's something on the iPad called restrictions. Anybody familiar with restrictions on the iPad? Some of you are. On the iPad, because the district Yes, we have a back-end management system called Casper, and we can peer in and see what's on those iPads, and we, you know, we've got that hooked in. Okay, so that's the non-negotiable for us. But you can say, that Apple ID that you use to purchase um, apps with, I love you, son, but I'm going to keep that password private. And you're not going to install apps unless you and I have this conversation. Okay? Or you can say, I love you, daughter, but... 
we're going to set restrictions so you can install no apps, no third-party apps, or you can only visit these websites. We've never had the ability from a parent side of things to get that kind of local control of what students can do. So the beauty of it is you can do just any, about anything you want to do. The danger of it is you can do just about anything you want to do. But also, we're putting in your hands the ability to do something about that. And that's something that Tim and I have talked about is ongoing education for parents, right? As kids learn more about this, how are parents going to understand how to set restrictions and how to... And honestly, it's an easy process. Some of our uh, parents at North have been through some of our sessions over there. We have videos, we, so you don't always have to come into something like this. So there's a lot of ways that we can handle that and help you <coughs> understand it. But self-management means you put on what you need, and self-management means you decide what should be there and shouldn't be there as a family. Okay? Um, so that's kind of the big concept of self-management. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I just had a question. I don't know if you covered this, but what about the data packages? Are they going to have any sort of data, or is, are all the households going to have to have wireless? That is a huge part of why we picked um, the iPad, honestly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I love all of the tools that are out there, but if you were to pick Chromebook, which is a, a cheaper option, a lot of our families don't have wireless at home. And so when you take a Chromebook home, unless you know, really know what you're doing with it, it's kind of a boat anchor in that you can't access the web, so you can't do much. Um, with the iPads, wireless is not a necessity. It's a value added, right? You can do a lot, but it's not a necessity. So they won't come with a data package on there. Um, and they won't have the ability to put a data package. They're just a Wi-Fi. But what, um, one of the things that's really valuable is if I'm a teacher and I'm pushing a PDF out to you through an app called Mobility, one of our core apps, that's what your worksheet is for the night. That's your assignment. You download that in class today. When you go home, even though there's no wireless, you can edit it. You can do all the things you need to do. And when you come back to school tomorrow, you can put it through Google Drive on the wireless at school and be OK. So we understand population-wise. Not everybody in Waukesha has wireless at home and available, or that McDonald's or the library is an easy jaunt to get to. And so that's one of the reasons we went for a little bit more expensive device that could work offline. Okay. Essentially what it looks like is our new digital backpack is a little bit different. So <laughs> when we have the bell at the end of the day, and our kids go to their lockers and go, okay, I have physics homework, I need that physics textbook, and I have... Uh, you know, math, I better bring that binder because I have that worksheet. Essentially it becomes, okay, have you downloaded everything that you need before you leave? Because you have Wi-Fi here, make sure before you go home to do your homework that you have everything downloaded. And that'll be something that we as teachers and as an educational institution need to work with as well. Um, and, and we have to work with students on helping them organize and help them make sure that they do download all that so that they are ready to go home if they do have homework. So do you foresee all of the books, the textbooks then being all e-books? Uh, right away, no. No. That, I mean, eventually, probably yes. But right away, no. No, I don't. Um, are we good here? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, well, Skip it. yeah. Okay. All right, so um, Learning Organization Waukesha, goals for building a 21st century organization. Um, essentially, <coughs> these are the main reasons that we have decided to look at putting technology in the hands of our students. To be a 21st century learning organization dedicated to equity, innovation, human excellence, and collaboration. That's our district vision overall. I almost would say that the fourth word here, 21st century learning, is honestly out of date. It's laughable, yeah. Um, because we're in the 21st century, and this is the reality that we live in right now. Um, and so as our kids continue to mature and go into the workforce, they're going to be well within that 21st century, and they're going to be looking already into that 22nd century. Um, but we are looking at optimal learning conditions through technology. We are looking at student achievement and being able to take your child wherever their current level is at and helping them out through a piece of technology that is going to add more flexibility. It's a whole lot easier to teach to your child's needs using technology than it is to teach to a class of 30, 35 kids and say, okay, I'm going to get to each one of you individually. And to be able to offer that flexibility. And then lastly, improvement in, in innovation processes. Again, this is super innovative, um, and that's one of the main reasons. So what is one-to-one -one technology? So each student will receive a new iPad. They will be receiving their new iPad 
in August. Okay, so typically if you've been a self-parent, you know that we did, I believe, two days of registration. Um, and it was freshmen, sophomores one day, and it was juniors, seniors the other day, and it was about a 10-hour day, and it was a whole bunch of fun for me. Um, so what we're really looking at is actually extending that out to about a week. And so freshmen will be on Monday, sophomores will be on Tuesday, juniors will be on Wednesday, seniors will be on Thursday, and then a makeup day on Friday. And those will be from about, and we're looking at about 4.30 to 7.30 at night, okay? Um, so that you can be present while your child is getting that iPad. And that's really what we're looking at. We'll have staff members here to help you out. Um, the biggest piece that you can have before you come is you can have your child's Apple ID and password ready to go. We are going to help your child walk through that process, creating that Apple ID. We're going to help them walk through that process in the next couple of weeks. You're going to get an all call from me saying, hey, in your English classes, your child is creating an Apple ID and a password. You're also going to get two forms that we'll talk about in a little bit. What I would do if I were you is that's a great night to have a discussion about one-to-one -one technology with your child and say, hey, so what's your Apple ID and what's your password? If you as a parent decide, you know what, I love you, son, but I'm going to be the only one who knows the password, that's the time to log in, hit change password, change the password to something that you know, and now you have that. Please, please, please don't lose that information. Okay, so when you come back, it's going to be a whole lot less of a headache for you to be able to come in, grab your iPad, have that Apple ID set to go. Okay, so we're going to work with your child on getting it done the first time, and then we're going to hopefully um, lean on you guys to have that discussion with your child. And if you would like to change that password, you certainly are more than welcome. Okay. Um, they will be bringing it home, um, as will middle school students, as will elementary school students, except for K pre-K-1. That's going to be a little bit different. So if you have children that are um, pre-K, kindergarten, or first grade, you may want to touch base with your school um, on, as to what that's going to look like. But from a secondary, middle school, and later grades and elementary schools, they will be taking those home. It is their responsibility. Okay. Um, so I just want to throw one piece in, and that is on the, the iPad itself. That iPad, um, one of the questions we get a lot is why do they have to have the newest one, right? Like, why does that have to be the case? The reality is that iPad is going to extend over the course of four years. Um, and so we purchased the new ones with the intent that as Apple and whatever other technology updates, this will be able to last time. We won't have to go, oh, well, this doesn't do any good. Now we bought the two-year-old model, and now I can't do what I need to do with it. Um, but along with that, and this is a critical piece for you to understand, it's not just that the district will have this iPad for four years. This will be assigned to your son or daughter for four years or whatever time they're left in school. Um, and so it's important for you to understand that their ability to take care of that iPad um, impacts them most directly, right? Bang, beaten, bruised, whatever. This is their iPad. There's not a lot of changing around and getting a new one or waiting until summer, turning them in, then fall getting all new ones when you come in. That is very much by design, as we studied one-to-ones, um, other successful ones, we found that when kids knew that this was going to be theirs over time, as opposed to just one that was left in the cart occasionally, they actually took more meaningful use of it and good care of it than they would have otherwise. So just understand that this will be theirs over the course of time, um, and, and that's just by design. So. Yep. Um, so what is the learner's responsibility? What is your child's responsibility? A um, couple of things. Students are expected to sign the iPad pledge and maintain their device accordingly. Um, the iPad pledge is basically, here's how I'm going to act with it. Um, here's what I'm going to utilize it for in school. It's going to be for education. Good. It's all past. Okay. It's for education in school. Okay. Um, and that's the purpose that we have it for. Um, will I tell you that over at North there was a lot of Facebook usage right off the bat? 110% yes. Absolutely, and I'm not going to deny that. And what is probably the first app that your kids will probably put on there is Facebook. Okay? Um, but know that as time went by, all of a sudden what we started to see over at North was a huge decrease in Facebook usage because all of a sudden it became the realization that student ownership of, whoa, I'm not focusing on my classes and I need to take that off. We had students actually restricting themselves on Facebook. 
so that they wouldn't be able to use it. So, yes, there is that ability. Again, if your parent and child have that discussion to allow your child to put whatever apps they want on, they certainly can. But the idea is that once you're in school, the educational purpose is for education. Please know this. I have told our teachers that their best lessons are their best lessons. iPad or no iPad. So there is the ability for a teacher to say, hey, we're going to learn today. And guess what? iPad's down. I want to see the apple on the back. And that's going to be an expectation for students. Okay? If a teacher, um, some teachers will have a green light, red light on their door. Green light means, hey, today is going to be an iPad day. Once you get in here, please log on to this Notability app. We're going to be doing lesson so on and so forth. Let's make sure that we have that ready. A red light means, sorry, it's not an iPad day. I don't want to see them out. Okay, keep them in your backpack. Okay, we are not forfeiting really good education for an iPad. We are enhancing really good education with an iPad. So please make sure that you know that there is that distinction. An iPad does not mean that every hour of every day your child will be expected to be on it. As a matter of fact, there are times where it's probably advantageous for your child to maybe step away from it and rest their eyes if anybody has sat in front of the computer for too long. Okay? Um, students are expected to follow the acceptable use policy and use their device for educational purposes only. Um, is this any different than the technology acceptable use it's policy? It's exactly the same thing, exactly. but that's the point is that up till now we've had kids do things on technology that have been less than de desirable behaviors. We've dealt with that through the acceptable use policy. The student mm -hmm. iPad pledge just takes it one, one step further and says, hey, by the way, we're giving this to you for educational reasons, and if we find that you're not using it for educational reasons, we have the right to confiscate it, we have the right to take that, you know, we can do what we need to. We own it, we'll do what we need to do with it. So just understanding that those things exist and have existed, but um, that's what governs our acceptable use of all of this. And while you can put on restrictions, um, your school can also put on restrictions as well. Um, if we have to have a conversation with your child about misusing an app, we can put on restrictions on that as well. We'll give you a phone call and say, hey, just so you know, we had to lock down this app. Um, you know, that's, that it's just not going to work. Maybe it's for a week, maybe it's for two weeks, maybe it's for the rest of the year. We'll have that discussion together. Um, the last one and probably the biggest kicker here is the iPads that are covered by insurance. And students and their families, families will be responsible for deductibles or replacement costs as outlined in the financial responsibilities um, form. Okay, so what does this mean? Yes, your child's iPad is insured. Keep in mind, the iPad that they are given this August is the iPad that they will keep for four years. Okay? So if it breaks, okay, we'll take it, we'll fix it, but your child's going to get it back. Okay? The first time it breaks, um, it's a $30 charge. The second time it breaks, it's a $60 charge. And the third time, and any time thereafter, it is a $100 charge for a $400 iPad. Okay, so that is, that's one of, one of the pieces that we have to fold in in order to say, hey, you've got to take good care of this. Okay, it's not something that you're just going to slam into your backpack, throw into the back of a locker. This is your iPad. Please take good care of it. The only other piece to this is, what did we forget last the time? The $25 yes. uh, consumable technologies fee. So there is, <coughs> along with this, there's a yearly $25 technologies fee. Um, that has been probably long coming down the pike and it just happens to be this is the timing that it comes with. It does not pay for the iPad, it does not pay for insurance, it does not pay for just apps. It covers kind of the whole collection of things that, that come along with this. For instance, I'm sure more of you are hearing about Blackboard here at South and resources being put on Blackboard. There's a wonderful mobility app uh, that goes along with Blackboard. That's a part of this. Um, the, the core apps are a part of this. Um, some of the online, you know, Alex and other, other technologies that exist. So there's a yearly $25 fee that uh, was imposed by the board, and that is, that is a piece of this that we didn't talk about at last meeting, but that is something that you'll want to be aware of. It's just an additional school fee that's a part of that. Um, the only other thing that I'll add to this <coughs> responsibilities piece is this. Um, it comes, the iPad comes with a thin kind of gel case to it. It's not going to save anything, really. I mean, in the big scheme of things, it's not going to do a ton to protect it if it gets dropped from a few feet or whatever. Um, 
Some families are opting to buy additional accessories. We leave that up to you. Uh, the reality is, as a district, to make an investment in really solid, sturdy cases at $80 to $100 a piece, this program would have never flown. Um, to make an investment in $80 to $100 uh, keyboard cases or something, the, the, the program would have never flown. Um, so things like, do I want to invest in a $30, $50 case and avoid, primarily avoid, having screen damage and cracks and whatever, because I know that my son, like if, if it was me as a kid, my mom probably should have put it on. And the way I beat my bag around in my after school activities, we should have done that. Um, for other kids, that's not an issue. They're careful there. So you need to make a determination as a family. There is no requirement by the district that you have any additional cases added. But if you feel that's something necessary for you or your, you know, your, your son or daughter, that's a choice. Along the same lines, we always get the question about keyboards. Um, it's the same question we all had when we started. Um, the district initially started buying iPads and bought keyboards right away prior to the student rollout parts of it. And what we found um, in some of our research and going down to Chicago and looking at their rollout was many students don't prefer the physical keyboard for typing. They do the on-screen typing. It's completely counter to what I do. And as a teacher of writing, I think like, really? But we watched it happen. Um, schools that have bought keyboards have found that percentages of those keyboards are sitting on the sidelines, not being used. And we saw that even at North this year, um, sitting in the library, kind of just observing kids after after Christmas and, and holiday break, um, and kids saying, "Yeah, I got a keyboard, and I don't even want to use the thing. Like, I don't know why we've got that." So, my my suggestion to you would be, even if your gut instinct is they need to have a keyboard, I I just hold off a little bit, right? when you get the iPad, before you make that investment, have that conversation and save yourself some money if that's not something they feel they need. But at the same point, if it's something they need, it is certainly up to you and your family if you, do, if you choose to add that to the iPad. A <coughs> um, couple of things just to build off of that. Our Booster Club is looking into providing Waukesha South um, iPad covers for purchase at the rollout. We'll try to put them right next to that gummy case. So that if you're going, you know what, I don't want that gummy case, you can go step right over to our booster club and they'll have those available um, for, for relatively cheap, comparatively speaking. They're also looking into the stylus pens as well. Um, we have found that North did say that that was one advantage was having the stylus pen um, was, was a nice addition to it. But largely, and again, blows my mind because I would need the keyboard. Um, the keyboard is something that they have found is, is not super advantageous for all kids. So I would hold off on that one for just a little bit, but if they need it, they need it. I certainly use mine all the time. So um, we, we can understand that from that perspective. Um, those are the actual pledges. You can kind of take a little bit uh, closer of a look once you actually go on to the presentation after this. Um, you don't have to try to read them right now. I know it's pretty tough. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I need to cover anything else. No, there. other than understand that that link that uh, Tim showed you at the beginning, the Waukesha One Parents, there's the forms. All of these forms are linked there. Um, they are in Spanish as well. So just so you understand that that's where you can find those resources as you need them. Okay. And so what finally, I think this is finally, we're getting close. We're getting close, yeah. Um, what is your parent uh, responsibility? And um, again, as we talked about Apple ID creation, um, once we actually try to set those up with your children, again, I would appreciate if you could have that conversation that night with your kids. Okay, so what was your ID? What is your password? Again, at that point in time, you can choose to change it. As a matter of fact, it's not just at that point in time. At any point in time, you can choose to change that Apple ID. Um, that's the beauty of that one. And managing the home use of the device. Um, <coughs> Brian had a, had a great suggestion as he was talking about how would, what would this look like in his family. And what you choose to do at home is completely up to you. Um, give your child the chance to disconnect. Maybe iPad use is only for kitchen and living room use, and they can't take it into their bedrooms, okay? So that they're not playing games at night, so that they're not on Facebook at night, so that you know that it's being used for educational purposes, so that your child, believe it or not, could actually sleep, okay? And if they sleep, Trust me, they'll get to school on time, and you'll receive a lot less Sunday phone calls from them. So that'd be advantage everyone. Um, but what you do at home um, is certainly up to you. If you come up with a great iPad rule that you're really proud of, please feel free to share with us. 
We'd love to share it out with other families. Again, let's use each other as resources to help make this a success for everybody. Um, responsible for reporting theft, loss, or damage to the device. This is kind of an important one to discuss with your child. The earlier you tell us that it is damaged, lost, or you believe stolen, the faster we can do something about it. The worst thing you can do is come to us and say, yeah, my child lost their iPad like five days ago. Do you know where it is? No. Okay. Um, but if we can get it right away, if you can tell your kid, you know what? Please go tell the office right away that it's gone. We can do some things right off the bat to try and find that iPad. Okay. A couple other things that you're going to want to do. Number one, if you do get a case, personalize the case. Especially if it's the same Waukesha South case that your friend just bought. Okay, now you have an identical iPad. Number two, on that screen where you have to plug in your numbers, there's a great opportunity to take a picture of your child and put it on there. Mm -hmm. So that when it comes up, we know whose it is. Oh, this is so-and-so's iPad, and they can't log in until that point. So get a nice goofy picture of them and tell them this is what they're going to keep on there once they log in. Okay? Let me, uh, let yep. me, so just one quick thing, and it is the financial piece of this. So in the event of theft, the key piece to, to, for you to understand is if the iPad was stolen, you need to file a police report. And that police report, and that's going to be on the family to do that, uh, the student to do that, that police report needs to be provided to the district, a copy of it. Once that has been done, you do not have to worry about a financial commitment for stolen devices. Okay, That's what our insurance covers. On the other side of that, finding an insurance company that covers loss, that doesn't exist. So if it's a loss device, that is the big one. That's the fearful one, right? That's where you will be asked to reimburse the district for the full cost of the device, the $500. We just want to be really clear about that. Um, and that's why it's important early, early monitoring. There's a tool on the iPad called Find My iPhone. Um, that's a great tool to use. I, we use this at home constantly. Uh, when my daughter's misplaced the iPad and we're not sure where it is in the house, we can send a signal to it and it'll be, but as long as it's on a wireless network, that's a value added. We've also heard stories of parents who are using that when they, um, when their son or daughter goes to a friend's house for a study night, right? And you can check in as long as it's connected to a wireless and you know the Apple ID, you can check in on Find My iPhone and see where that iPad is and if it's in use. So we're hearing all sorts of interesting things that can be done with that. But that can be another value in, in the event of a loss or potential theft. Yep. Are there any certain situations that you would experience where theft has been more common? Or I, you, you just hit my... Uh, do we have any students here? Raise your hand if you're a student. Okay, great. Make sure it's your right hand. Okay, I... Say it, repeat after me. I, I will not will take my iPad take my into the gym locker room. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, you just promised me. Okay, um, that is probably one of the more common areas that we have any sort of theft. Um, so if you're going to gym, please lock all of your belongings into your hallway locker that has a lock on it. Okay, do not take anything worth anything into that gym locker room. Okay, it's an area that we cannot monitor um, via cameras. So that's the hard part. Okay, so please, please, please make sure that you do not take this into the gym locker room. Great question. Thank you for asking. Um, finally, um, the understand the shift in the educational paradigm and the role technology plays in student learning. Again, I cannot reiterate enough, and it's my thought too, this is not the way we were taught. And it's not the way we went through the educational process. But with how fast technology and careers are changing, we owe it to our kids to give them the ability to learn how to use these and learn how to use them appropriately so that we can prepare them for their jobs that we don't even know what they are at this point in time as they go out to that career field. So it's super, it's very important that we get our kids into the technological aspects of society. Um, let's work together to do it. Yes, it's a shift. Yes, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but if we work together, we can make it a really positive experience. And then lastly, the financial responsibility forms 
Um, the, again, the biggest cost you're going to have is $25 a year. The only other cost that you would have is if it is damaged, it's at 30, 60, 100 rising cost. Okay. Um, only one thing I want to add in is in that shift in educational paradigm. I think I think transparency on this is really key. Um, understand that while it is not what we have gone to school and under, uh, and learned, it is also not what the teachers at South High School went to school and learned and experienced. They are going to be in a very uh, kind of quick to catch up and understand what this all means in their classroom mode. And so on day one of school next year, I promise you, you're not going to see people like doing whiz-bang things with technology. Some will, but you're not going to see everybody feeling that way. You're doing that. They're learning a lot right now. Um, they're getting, I would think, very good mentoring and PD right now. They're having lots of conversations about it. Um, and what we saw at North was really teachers started to hit their stride November, December, yes, there were still people who do not feel comfortable even today with the technology. Um, but really, don't expect it on day one, but you're going to watch an evolution happen with, with your teachers and the experience as your kids are coming home and, and saying, instead of writing an essay, I'm doing this, sure. or I'm instead of 50 math problems, I'm doing this. And that's that shift in paradigm. So uh, I say that as kind of you know not being here itself. Give them a little bit of slack on the front side because they're really learning a lot. Um, and, and they'll, they'll meet that challenge. So. And as per usual, usually when your kids are, or when you're struggling with technology, who do you go to to help the kids because they know more than you do? They, they probably know more than our teachers do too. So that's, that's that kind of, we got to catch up as well. If this is in regards to technology. When you say that they're going to have this all four years, we know how quickly Apple updates things. I mean, how, how do we know that this is still going to be a relevant device two years from now, a year and a half from now? We, we, I'm, I'm communicating what the plan is on paper, but you're 100% accurate. What is that, gonna, that shift going to be? Um, one thing you learn as you start planning this is at some point you have to pick a path and go with it because you get completely, like, we'd still be arguing about what device. So you're absolutely right. Couldn't agree more. But uh, what we're trying to do is financially plan what will make this a viable program, and so that's where the four years piece comes into it. Will something amazing change in March, and we'll go, we're going to have to reinvestigate for the next wave of kids coming in. That could happen. Um, what I hope that isn't, though, is that isn't a platform shift. Like, we're going to go to something we've never heard of before, okay? And the other thing that I can guarantee you is the educational paradigm piece, that's not going to shift. That, we're, in a, we're moving in a direction where kids are showing what they know differently. So that's why mm -hmm. I consistently like consult teachers about that piece of it. Remind yourself of the paradigm shift that's what we're going through. But you're right, absolutely. I was just going to go back to the top of the last slide with the Apple ID creation. There's a lot of Horning students sitting here right now, incoming freshmen for next year. Um, Horning is sending home letters, you might have already got one already, about the creation of Apple IDs. Their platform is sending it out so that they can do it at home or get assistance at school. And if you don't have Wi-Fi, you can go to the library, you can come to the school. So the parents are setting it up for their student. Our 9th, 10th, and 11th graders are going to be doing that in-house in their English classes, like Mr. Joint said before, and then going home, and the parents are going to have the option to adjust that, that passcode. So if you want to save your time, this is kind of going out for Horning students, soon to be ninth grade students to save yourself time for that Monday student rollout so that you're not waiting in line then going over to a computer sitting down and it's you're going to stretch out the time that you're here have that Apple ID already created ahead of time so I just wanted to kind of make that clear as Horning is doing a little bit differently than South is doing it's it's all of the same thing it's just kind of more at the parent and the home end of things so if you have any questions let us know so what are the joint responsibilities? What do we have as responsibilities as a team? So within this self-managed model, um, we'll be you know, giving out each student um, a self-managed model, and then we're looking at apps. Okay? Please know that if your child comes home and says, I need this app, and I need it tomorrow, okay, that's not the case. All right? That should have been messaged days in advance. Okay, so we're asking our... It's a hot spot right now. Yeah, what is going on? <laughs> Google Voice. It's a really good presentation. Yeah. Someone so knows they have an overdue book in the library. <laughs> um, 
I'm sorry. Uh, but as they come home, we're trying to really look at what apps we need for our children and really take a really good look at that so that what we're not doing is saying, hey, let's try this app. No, that didn't work. Let's try this app. No, that didn't work. Okay, let's try this app. No, that didn't work. Let's put some really good effort as educators into looking at which apps really truly are the most effective. Okay? And then we will message that home to you to say, hey, we actually do need this app. But there should be plenty of days of advance notice for you to be able to talk about that with your child. Again, with that self-managed model, your child may need to come home and say, hey, I need this app. Okay? But that core set of apps that the district is going to provide um, are really, really, truly powerful apps um, that are really just fantastic for educational purposes that Brian and